Bochotabaot, ladies, and welcome to our weekly edition of Torah classes. And whether you're logging on to ohelsara.com or to Torah anytime, or if you're a YouTube subscriber and follower, you know that we are so happy that every week you tune in with such devotion and dedication to the learning of Torah. And we thank you for that. And we bless you for that. We give you a bracha that HaKadosh Baruch Hu should continue to fortify your neshama with the desire to continue to learn His great Torah, great and holy Torah. I want to apologize formally for the fact that I usually, you know, give, uh, try to post a shir Sunday or Monday at the latest, but um, this past week, I wasn't feeling so great, and now, Bar Hashem, I started to feel a little better. So, it, sorry that I'm delayed, but at least, Bar Hashem, we're not skipping a week. Uh, that's number one. And second of all, I wanted to thank all the people who are donating and are con continuing to donate so generously to our campaign to try and purchase a unit here in Eretz Yisrael as a Torah center for for women and, and girls. Thank you so, so, so much. I know you know what to do. I don't have to now talk about it again and again. Anybody who ever wants to donate can log on to ohelsara.com and, and help us with our mission to spread Torah. This week's Shi'ur, I want to dedicate to a lovely young lady whose mother I've become very close to. Ophelia from Bet Shemesh, such a cute lady. I love you, Ophelia, you're adorable. We've been trying to get her daughter into a high school that her daughter wanted to get into. And you know how the feeling is, you're a young girl going into high school, you're checking out the various places and your heart is set on one specific place. And you apply and you're waiting and waiting for a letter, a phone call from the school letting you know uh, you got in. And we were waiting for quite a number of weeks and it was like a, we, we were on spilkas, so to speak. Baruch Hashem, we got word today that, the, that, that this young girl was accepted. Woohoo! We're so happy for her. So this shoe, I promised her mother that this shoe was going to be dedicated to Le'ah Bat Ophelia's continued success in everything that she does, high school, past high school, Dosh Baruch Hu should continue to give her tremendous kochot in her ruchaniyot and everything that she does, Bechol Masei Yadeha, and Be'ezat Hashem, it should be a new beginning, high school, it's a milestone, Be'ezat Hashem, with kochot nefesh, Briyut Eitana, health and happiness, should be happy in this school. Leia, we love you. This week's parasha has a double header. We combine two parashiyot, Vayakel and Pekude. Plus, we've got an extra special bonus, as this Shabbat is Shabbat Mevarim, the Shabbat where we bless the new month, which is Nisan, which is going to grace our calendar next week, Bezat Hashem. So today we're going to learn a very interesting insight that I hope will encourage married couples and all the singles out there who I believe will soon marry and build a bait na'aman be Israel, amen keni ratzon, a beautiful Torah home. Our parashiyot discuss the Mishkan, the holy tabernacle. The Mishkan was like a shul, a, like a portable synagogue that was made in very special detail. It included gold and silver. It had to be constructed according to certain dimensions that HaKadosh Baruch Hu told over to Moshe. It had to be constructed with holy kavanot. This was the holy meeting place that B'nai Israel used as they traveled in the desert throughout their 40-year sojourn. The Mishkan traveled, traveled with them wherever they went. The purpose of this structure was to draw HaKadosh Baruch Hu's divine presence from the upper realms down to the earth below. Hashem's main abode is in Shemaim, but we want to feel Him down below as well. We want to feel Him close over here. So the Mishkan was a spiritual conduit that was able to draw down the Shekhinah, Dosha, down to the people. 
Obviously, the mere structure itself wasn't enough to do this. Uh, the Kohanim had to do their holy service in the Mishkan. Certain kavanot had to be uh, invoked. Offerings had to be brought, etc. Today, we have no Mishkan. We don't have a Bet Mikdash. Now, the Pasuk in Sefer Shemot states, Ve'asuli Mikdash. Make for me a sanctuary, Hashem says, v'shachanti betocham, so that I may dwell within their midst. So the Mishkan, which was a mini Bet Migdash, served a very important purpose in that HaKadosh Baruch Hu was with us, close to us. The holiness was palpable here on earth. But when the Mikdash is not with us, we lose that benefit. So the question is, how do we compensate for this great loss? Since we don't have a Bet Mikdash that stands today, what's the vehicle we could use to draw the Shekhinah down into the world, into our life, into our homes, into our hearts? Chachamim tell us that one of the ways this can be done is through the institution of marriage. The Gemara of Sota states, Ish ve'isha zachu, when a man and a woman merit to be married and they're worthy, Shechina benahen, the divine presence dwells in their midst, establishing a Jewish home where the foundation is holy and the man and the woman merit in this union, that's equal to building a Mishkan. That's why every Jewish couple that stands under a chuppah, what happens? Under that chuppah, the man turns to the woman with the ring in his hand and he says, actually she's on his right, he says to her, Hare at mekudeshet li. Behold, you are now sanctified unto me. The word li was also used by Hashem when he commanded Bnei Israel to construct the Mishkan, ve'asu li mikdash. In this generation where we're lacking the Ve'asuli Migdash, where we don't have a holy Migdash, we have the Hare'at Mekudeshet Li. A couple gets married and that's meant to accomplish the same objective as the Migdash. A holy marriage is then able to draw down the Shekhinah HaKedosha. That's why at the end of every wedding ceremony, we have a minhag, we have a custom that I'm sure you're all familiar with, where the chatan, the bridegroom, breaks a glass. Why does he break the glass? There are many lessons, but the main reason is in remembrance of the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash. That's interesting. Why do we have this custom specifically at a wedding? Why don't we break a glass at a Brit Milah, at a Pidyon Ben? How come we don't break a glass at a Bar Mitzvah? Why is it that only at a Chatuna, at a wedding, we break a glass to remember the destruction of the Bet HaMikdash? Chachamim ask, since we no longer have a Bet Mikdash, what took its place and has the ability to draw down the Shekhinah? Ish ve'isha zachu shechina benehen. A marriage founded on holiness. No. So at the time that a marriage is being forged, the new couple needs to remember that there was once a Mishkan, that there was a Bet Mikdash that stood that no longer serves as a medium of drawing down the Shekhinah into the world. That moment that the Chatan breaks the glass is a moment of deep introspection, of thinking about what we lost and what we could do to rebuild the Bet HaMikdash. So as we begin to build a Jewish home, we break the glass to remember HaKadosh Baruch Hu's home that once stood tall and majestic and was sadly destroyed. That's the simple interpretation of the minhag of breaking the glass. But if that's the reason why we break the glass at the end of the wedding, there's a wedding ceremony, there's a question that needs to be asked. 
What does everybody do as soon as the Chatan breaks the glass? Everybody yells out, Mazel Tov! And the music starts playing and all the men, they run to the chupa and they start dancing in front of the couple with great joy and everybody's celebrating. What, what's going on over here? We, we just broke a glass in memory of the destruction of the Bet HaMikdash and as soon as the Chatan broke the glass, everybody yells out, Mazel Tov! And you're rejoicing? I mean, you, you just did a Paul de Mayon, an active imagery that when you broke the glass, it's like the destruction of the Bet HaMikdash. How is it that immediately following the breaking of the glass, there's this merriment and, and festivity? Does that make sense? Now the truth is that for that reason there are some people who do have the custom of breaking the glass earlier on in the, in the ceremony and not at the end. Why? Because since the Chatan breaks the glass uh, towards the beginning of the ceremony and, and the ceremony hasn't yet come to an end, so most of the guests they just yell out uh, kind of like under their, oh, Mazel Tov, Mazel tov, eh, very quietly because they know that the chupa uh, uh, has to resume respectfully. But the majority of Am Yisrael does have the custom of breaking the glass at the end of the wedding. Uh, of the ceremony. So the question remains, what is all this rejoicing about when we just remember the destruction of the Bet HaMikdash? The reaction of the guests after the breaking of the glass seems inappropriate. If we could offer other reasons as to why we break the glass, we might understand that joyous reaction and we're going to see how fascinating this minhag of breaking the glass really is. As you know, on Friday night, we recite the Kiddush. We take a beautiful cup, usually made out of silver. It's a silver cup. By the way, why silver and not gold? It's very ra rare to find a golden Kiddush cup on a Shabbat table, even though I'm sure there are a lot of people out there who could afford to purchase one. But there is a reason why we use a silver cup and not a gold cup, because in general, Silver represents mercy, hachamim, while gold represents judgment. Silver is a lighter color, closer to white, whereas gold is a darker color. It's actually closer to red. The gold of yesteryear, especially was, if it was uh, 24 karat uh, gold, wasn't as yellow. It was a darker color, closer to the red family in its tone. And red, as we know, is the color of judgment. Therefore, since we want to evoke mercy, we use a silver cup at our Shabbat tables. Now, Chachamim tell us that the cup itself, the cup itself, no matter what material it's made out of, represents din, represents judgment. Why does a cup represent din? Because Hashem's name that represents Din, the attribute of Din, is Elohim. When we see the name Elohim, we know that there's some kind of judgment involved over here. Now, the numerical value of the name Elohim is 86. That's the same gematria as the word Kos, which means a cup. The Ben Ishchai Alav Shalom explains that a kos represents the judgments, the dinim. So what became the minhag in the olden days concerning the chuppah ceremony? Well, uh, they'd make the, the brachot, all the blessings on, on the cup under the chuppah. They'd drink the contents in the cup, but, but once the cup was empty, they were left holding the kos that represents all the judgments. What should they do? They want to break the dinim because they don't want the Chatan and Kala to be impacted by any kind of judgment. So, so the Chatan broke the glass and that was as though the couple was ridding themselves of all the judgments, all the dinim, any negative decrees that may have ensued. If that's the case, we can understand why as soon as the Chatan breaks the glass, everybody yells out, Mazel Tov! And they begin to celebrate. Everybody's happy that the dinim were done away with and that the couple can now begin their new life with mercy.
So it, it, it's not that the rejoicing and the celebration is in any way connected to the destruction of Yerushalayim and the Bet HaMikdash, but rather the celebration is of the dinim being eradicated. That's one explanation. There's another reason why we break the glass under the chuppah. Whenever we do something great, like getting married, which is one of the holiest endeavors in life, the Satan makes an attempt to sabotage our great efforts. Any time you're involved in an important deed, something that's going to yield holy results, there's always going to be some kind of resistance. The Satan knows that there's an important and spiritual endeavor and he's going to do whatever he can to put stumbling blocks in your path. When there's difficulty and resistance, you know that something good is about to come to fruition. It's like the famous saying, no pain, no gain. So Chachamim tell us that when we're involved in some kind of spiritual endeavor and we need to keep the Satan as far away as possible, we should bribe him. For example, on Yom Kippur, we spend the entire day asking HaKadosh Baruch Hu for Mechila and Selicha, for spiritual atonement. As we're davening in shul, the Satan is just itching to bring judgments against us. He wants to open our spiritual folders before HaKadosh Baruch Hu and show Hashem how we're actually undeserving of forgiveness and how we go through this every single year where we ask for forgiveness and then we repeat our offenses. The Satan tries to convince Hashem not to fall for our like repentance spiel, so to speak. So in order to quiet the Satan, what did the Kohanim do in the olden days? They would take a seir, a goat, they would take it to a mountain cliff called Azazel, and then they would throw the goat off the cliff. That, that, that sounds horrible. I mean, that sounds horrible. How do we throw this poor goat off the mountain to fall to its death? I mean, in this generation, that would be considered animal cruelty. If the ASPCA was, was, was there at that time and they would see this, they'd probably put, put the Kohanim in prison. And yet we did this act on Yom Kippurim, on the holiest day of the year. The Kohen took the goat and hurled it over the mountain. Such an act, I mean, it sounds uh, like a little bit satanic. Guess what? The Ramban al Shalom says, it is, so to speak. He writes that this was a bribe to the Satan in order to keep him quiet. You see, every day on the Jewish calendar, every day of the year, the Satan is given the right to prosecute against us, except for one day a year, and that's on Yom Kippurim. On Yom Kippur, we offer him a bribe, and he remains quiet. That's why the word Hasatan, the Satan, spelled Hey, Sin, Tet, Nun, Sofit, in Gematria is equal to 364. Uh, <laughs> the Satan is only given permission to prosecute against us 364 days of the year. But on that one day of the year, on Yom Kippurim, his power of prosecution becomes constrained. That's why, I don't know if you ever noticed, many of the tefillot on Yom Kippurim, especially the tefillah of Musaf, speaks about this seir, this goat that's pushed off the cliff. It was to bribe the Satan. In line with this concept, the Zohar Kadosh informs us that a person, after he's eaten a, a heavy-duty meal, which would include bread, where he washes uh, and, and has the bread, he feels very full, very satiated, bloated. He's even stationary, he can't move after such a meal. But as the person is sitting there feeling all satiated from the meal, the Zohar Kadosh says that the Satan approaches Hashem and says, look at these people. Look at how much they ate. They have so many sins under their belt. They shouldn't be eating. 
They should be fasting all day. Instead, look at them, they're, 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 they're enjoying their meal as if they're innocent and pure. He's prosecuting. Even in such a situation where we eat a meal, we need to quiet the Satan. So what do we generally do at the end of every meal that includes bread? We wash our fingertips. The minhag is called Maim Achonim. It's a chova. And we say Maim Achonim chova. I gave a shiur about this, by the way, in 2020, I believe. The Maim Machonim is generally done at the table, where we use a, a, a special designated, a little mini, looks like a pitcher, mini tiny little pitcher, where we put the water in that little tiny pitcher. The pitcher sits on another vessel that has a hole in it, where the water that's poured sits in that vessel. And many times you notice that as soon as we finish doing the Mai Machonim, we immediately remove the vessels from the table, we get rid of it, including the napkins that we use to dry our hands. Why? Chachamim revealed to us that the Satan, he likes like the, the grub, the grease, all, all, all the things that we think are like disgusting and dirty, that's something that the Satan has an affinity to. So at the end of the meal, we wash our fingertips that were submerged in all the food and everything, and the water of that leftover dirt on our fingers, so to speak, all that dirt, we give to the Satan in order to appease him so he should not prosecute against us. So there are many examples that we could cite concerning this idea. I'm just going to give you another uh, example uh, from a story in the Gemara concerning a rabbi who before he gave any of his lectures would first tell a joke and then he would continue the shiur. And all the Rabbanim wondered why, why, why would he start the lecture with a joke? On a simple level, the Gemara is teaching us a speech communication 101 class. The Gemara is teaching us that in order to catch the audience's attention, you should not ever begin your speech with the Pasuk states if you do, you'll most likely lose half the crowd. I mean, rather you should begin with either a humorous remark or some kind of lightweight opening because that's going to open the hearts of the people and then they'll be more inclined to listen to the words that you want to impart. That's on a simple level. But the depth of this is that the rabbi knew he was about to give a shi'ul Torah. Offering words of Torah that strengthens and enhances the people's emunah is something that contains great value in the spiritual realm. The Satan sees this and he's going to do whatever he can to disrupt and interfere with that lesson. So what did this Rav do? What did he decide to do before every class? He gave the Satan a little bribe. He told a joke. The joke offers the Satan a little piece of the action so he shouldn't interfere with the lecture. So what do we do at a wedding in order to keep the Satan from jeopardizing it? We take the glass and we break it. Now that's not very proper. I mean, it's not something Jews do. We don't just go around breaking things. Why would, why would we do that? But breaking the glass is like the Mai Machonim, where we're giving the, the leftover remnants to the Satan so that he shouldn't get in the way of this newly married couple. So the breaking of the glass it becomes very significant. Having said that, several, several years ago at a wedding, uh, the Kala approached the officiating Rav after the chupa, and she said, Kvodav, can you please give me the broken pieces of glass? And the Rav said, well, wh what do you want the glass for? And she said, oh, I, I want to make a decoupage out of the broken uh, pieces. And the, 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 the Rav was shocked. He couldn't believe it. But she wants to make an arts and, and, and crafts project out of the pieces that we give to the Satan. I mean, uh, oh my God. Uh, obviously, when the Rav explained the significance of the broken glass to this young girl, she was shocked. She didn't know. And uh, she immediately changed her mind. 
Ladies, it's so important for us to educate ourselves concerning Yahadut and the Minhagim that revolve around certain key events in our life. Certainly, a marriage ceremony, a chupa, should be something that a chatan and kala learn about so that they understand the greatness, the significance, and holiness of that moment as they're standing on, underneath the, the, the kipata shamaim. Every chatan and kala should know exactly what's taking place under a chupa. But, but I want you to notice how one seemingly simple minhag of breaking the glass has many reasons behind it. In Judaism, we have many customs, and sadly, we don't always take the time to understand the meaning behind those customs. That's why, by the way, Chachamim warn us never to belittle a Jewish custom because there's always a logic that stands behind that custom. There's a story concerning the great Ramah of Moshe Esrlis, Salav Shalom. He was a young man who became the rabbi of the city of Krakow in Poland. On his first day on the job, in the morning after Tfilat Shacharit, the Gabai of the shul stood up with a piece of paper and he began to announce the following. We'd like to wish a hearty Mazel Tov. Congratulations to the following men. Mr. Klein, I'm making up these names obviously, Mr. Kornfeld, Mr. Hirsch, Mr. Bloom, Mr. Applebaum, etc., etc., and everybody yells out, Mazel Tov! And all the congregants are making a big issue, and everybody's happy. I don't know, Ahmad didn't understand what, what went on over here. So he asked the Gabbai, what, what event, what simcha took place for these men that they deserve such a big Mazel Tov? So the Gabbai said, oh, no, 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 there was no event. You see, these are the men whose wives just went to the mikveh last night. But the Ram was shocked. What? 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 You, you make an announcement of whose wife went to the mikveh and everybody yells out, woohoo, super, we're so happy, your wife went, what? But when a woman goes to the mikvah, it's supposed to be the most private matter. And here you're getting up and you're announcing it to the entire congregation. You know what? From now on, we are abolishing this custom. And the Gabbai said, but Kvodav, we've been doing this for so many years. This, this has been our custom in this city. The Rav said, I understand, but it doesn't make any sense. It's, it's outlandish. So the city of Krakow stopped with this minhag. A few weeks later, a man who was out of town on business came back and he attended the tefillot in shul in the morning. And since his wife had immersed in the mikveh the night before, the man was waiting for the grand uh, announcement, the hearty mazel tov and all the hoopla, but it never came. So he went over to the Gaba and he said, what happened? How come I didn't get my uh, usual uh, hearty acknowledgement? So the Gaba explained that while he was away, the Holy Ramah had come to town and he is now the Rav of this shul and he did away with that custom. But then the Gaba said to him, look, you should know that we still make a list of all the women who went to the mikveh. When the women go, we write down their names. And so I don't know how to tell you this, but your wife is not on that list. So the man is surprised. Says, what do you mean she's not on the list? She, she told me she went to the mikveh. The Gabbai said, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. She's not on the list. And the Gabbai found this very odd. And they started to investigate the matter. And lo and behold, they found out that the wife had not gone to the mikveh the night before. She merely just walked around the block, she put a little water on her uh, head, and uh, she told her husband that she went to the mikveh. Now, to give this woman the benefit of the doubt, we'll say this. It's a terrible thing what happened. It's a quite an offensive crime. It's a big pesha. But in the olden days, they didn't have heated mikvaot like we do today. It was very difficult, especially in the wintertime, for women to immerse in a mikveh. But the bottom line was that this man's wife had not immersed in the mikvah and he was beside himself. So he ran to the Ramah, this man ran to the Rav and he said, Kvod Rav, what should I do? My wife didn't really go to the mikvah, she just put some water on her head and then she came home. The Ramah was stunned. He took a, 
took a step back and he said, wow, wow. Now I understand why this city had this minhag. They made this, they would make the grand announcements in the shul of which women went to the mikveh so that the women should not desecrate this mitzvah and fake their way through it. This custom that I abolished was placed in order to prevent women from lying about immersing in the mikveh. I sinned by abolishing this custom which inadvertently caused this woman to feel that she could cheat her way out of going to the mikveh. The Rama felt so bad, he tore his clothing as if in a state of mourning. And he said, I thought this custom was awful and outrageous, but now I see that every minhag has its purpose. And I, in my grievous error, abolished this minhag and caused a grave sin to occur. He immediately reinstated the minhag and when he, when he wrote his next halacha sefer, whenever he referred to certain customs, he wrote, V'chen ha-minhag, this is the custom, ve'en l'shanot, and do not change it, it's not to be changed. So our minhagim have meaning and purpose, and that includes all the minhagim that seem strange, unnecessary, outdated, Amin Hagim are holy. Having said that, the breaking of the glass under the chuppah is just one example of a minhag that seems strange to some people. But as we're learning, it's quite important. So let me tell you another reason why we break the glass under the chuppah. Chachamim comment that the reason we break the glass under the chuppah is to remember the day of death. How do you kill a glass? You break it. Now, from time to time, it is commendable to consider our mortality and that our time on earth is limited. But, but, but you're going to think about that under the chuppah and on one of the most joyous days of your life? When we get married, our life begins. Why would we want to think about the end of life, about death? I'll explain it to you. Did you ever wonder why we have to bear children? Why does the Torah command us to have children? One of the reasons is because we don't live forever. If we don't procreate, the world will eventually come to an end. Because each of us has an expiration date, we try and create future generations that will continue to exist in this world. On the wedding night, we remind ourselves of our true purpose in this world. So we break the glass in order to remember the mortality of man, to remind ourselves that we must prepare the foundations for the next generation. That thought is not supposed to be a morbid thought. It's meant to be a happy thought because we're remembering our mortality in the most positive of ways that we're here in order to maintain the existence of mankind and that our purpose is to bring life to this world and create continuity. Think of the words that a chatan utters to his bride under the chuppah, which binds her to him. What does he say? Har'e'at mekudeshet li. Behold, you are sanctified unto me. Betabatzu with this ring, kedat Moshe veYisrael, according to the laws of Moshe and Israel. Did you ever count those words? Let's do it together. Harei at mekudeshet li, betabatzu, kedat Moshe veYisrael. Oh, there are nine words in this statement, in this declaration. Why did the Rabbanim compose a nine-word binding ceremony? Nine represents the nine months of pregnancy. These words hint to the objective of the marriage. Besides the union between a man and a wife, besides the oneness that the couple achieves in that union, 
They have a purpose that goes beyond themselves. And the purpose in that union is to create future generations. And the Zohar Kadosh alludes to something very, very deep. Our Chachamim ask, why is it that when the family is all standing under the chuppah, the natural reaction is that everybody starts crying? Why is everybody under the chuppah in tears? It's such a happy night. It's such a milestone in life. It's such a beautiful and holy occasion. Why the tears? I mean, the father of the Kala is crying because he's got to pay for the wedding, you know, so he has a right to cry, Misken. But why is everybody else crying? Of course, the superficial reason is that it's an emotionally charged occasion. Every parent waits for this moment in his child's life. The tears flow because we've raised this child to enter the chuppah and begin building his own Bait Na'aman. But it's deeper than that. The Zohar Kadosh tells us something that all of us can relate to. We're taught that there are many times in a person's life when he suddenly becomes overwhelmed with emotions and he begins to cry unexpectedly. You know why that is? It's because your neshama senses something that just activated your tears even though you have no clue why you're crying. Your neshama knows very well why it is that there are tears flowing down your cheeks. When a parent is standing under the chuppah, the neshama of the parent sees a couple getting married, kiddat Moshe Yisrael, according to the Jewish law. And then the neshama of the parent wonders, why is this couple getting married? And then the neshama of the parent realizes that this couple is getting married in order to bring children into the world because they're not going to live forever. The neshama of the parent realizes that they brought these children into the world so that they can continue and live because they're not going to live forever in this world. And at that moment, the neshama of the parent senses the mortality of man and it triggers the tears. The real reason we all cry under the chuppah is because the neshama feels and senses the real reason for this union. There's another reason we break the glass at a wedding. The holy Bala Rokea Chalav Shalom explains that we break the glass in order to commemorate the breaking of the two luchot, the two tablets that Moshe Rabbeinu shattered at Har Sinai. Why is it that at a wedding we would want to commemorate the breaking of the Luchad? That wasn't the best situation for Am Yisrael. It was actually tragic. Shimon HaAmsoni, Allah Shalom, who was a, a, a third generation Tana, that means he was a, a great man, and he's mentioned in the Gemara um, as having a theory that there are no extra words in the Torah. He felt that every word has a purpose and is filled with meaning and that there isn't one extra word in the Torah that does not belong there. He said that even the smallest word, like the word et, spelled alef, taf, which appears numerous times in the Torah, is there to tell us something. So his chidush concerning the word et was that whenever you see it in a pasuk, it's there in order to include something. So what did he do? He began to go through every et in the Torah and he, and, he, and he came up with astounding interpretations for each of them and what that et came to include. As he reached the end of the Torah, which means the end of his lifelong project, he came across the pasuk, et Hashem elokecha tira, you shall fear your God. Shimona and Sony stopped there and he wondered what could this pasuk come to include other than fearing Hashem? I mean, who else in the world would we have to fear other than Hashem? Shimona and Sony thought about it for 
quite a long time, and he concluded that all the other ets in the Torah worked according to his interpretation, and he was indeed able to find uh, what the word et in almost in all of the psukim came to include, except for when he got to this pasuk, he was stuck. Et Hashem elokecha tira. You must fear your God. What could et be including over here? Because he couldn't find an inclusion, he assumed that his theory about the word et coming to include something may have been flawed. What did he do? He took all of his chidushim and shelved them. Could you imagine? Years later, the great and holy Rabbi Akiva Lava Shalom taught us that all those ets of Shimon Hamsoni were, were correct. He came along Rabbi Akiva and he provided a chidush for this pasuk. And he revealed to us what the et is coming to include in the pasuk of et Hashem Elokecha Tira. He wrote, of course you have to fear God, but there are others that you have to fear almost the way that you fear Hashem. And that is the Talmidei Chachamim, the holy Torah scholars. We have to fear them as well because they're the ones who help us connect to Hashem. They're the ones who bring us closer to Hashem. They're the ones who teach us Hashem's Torah. They're the ones who guide us through the Emet. They're the ones who instill in us all of Hashem's words, His Divrei Musar v'tochacha. They're the ones who are directing us. Now that's a beautiful interpretation, but what inspired Rabbi Akiva to place the Rabbanim on such a high level? I mean, after all, Shimon HaAmsoni did not dare come up with this interpretation. But when Rabbi Akiva came along, he was daring enough to make that declaration. What motivated him to put the Rabbanim on this pedestal? I'll tell you what. When Rabbi Akiva realized that Shimon HaAmsoni, this great sage, had such intellectual honesty that when he felt his theory just didn't work and was willing to shelve his entire life's work, when Rabbi Akiva saw how much a Rav is willing to sacrifice for the truth and integrity of Torah, he felt he could declare that the Rabbanim should be feared to some degree as much as we fear Hashem. So Rabbi Akiva's inspiration was actually motivated by Shimon HaAmsoni himself. I, I want you to think about this for a moment. Do you know how difficult it is to work on something for so many years, to invest your spiritual, mental, and physical strength into the project, to make it your life's mission, and then suddenly to say, I think I was wrong. I, th I, I think I was mistaken. Wow, that takes a great deal of truth and intellectual integrity. Because the nature of a person is such that the more we invest in something, the more we become entrenched in a project that we truly believe in, and then we discover that there's a serious glitch or an error that we made. We instinctively try to defend ourselves and our project. A person's nature is to try and protect his position. You know, many years ago, there was a study done that was written in the um, Wall Street Journal, uh, and it was a, a study done on, on people who submitted their theses uh, at, in college, whether it was a student or a, a professor. And in that study, they concluded that seven out of 10 people who submitted their thesis knew that their thesis was full of fallacies, blunders, and holes, and, and they still submitted their paper, even though they knew that something here is rotten in Denmark. They didn't dare to admit it. Why? Because they worked on this thesis of theirs 
for so long. And when they realized that they made a mistake, it was too difficult for them to retract their thesis. It was too emotionally taxing on them to admit that their premise was faulty. So they simply submitted the thesis with all those errors. There was a great rabbi named Rabbi Shloyma Zalman Arbach, Alava Shalom. He was the Rosh Yeshiva of Yeshivat Kola Torah. Before he became the Rosh Yeshiva, he had to present a, a model lesson to the student body. And several of the Rabbanim of the Yeshiva sat in on that lecture as he proceeded to give an entire drasha in front of everybody that was very well thought out and very well prepared, genius. But in the middle of the lecture, there was a student who raised his hand and he said, Kvodarav, according to what you're saying, there's a question that needs to be asked. When Reb Zalman heard the question, he told that student, you know what? You're right. That question raises another question concerning my entire premise. Please forgive me. It seems I was mistaken in my entire argument. Class dismissed. And everybody leaves the room. In the back of his mind, Rabbi Shloyma Zalman is thinking, oh my gosh, uh, 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 he's certain that this interview is going to come to an end. But the other Rosh Yeshiva, whose job it was to hire, stood up and went over to him and he said, Rabbi Shloyma Zalman, you have the job. You're exactly the man that we're looking for. We are looking for someone who could be honest and humble at the same time. We're looking for the one man who, despite working so hard on his drasha, can recognize his own error and admit it without trying to cover it up with all kinds of pilpulim and justifications and, uh, and, and spiritual endeavors. We're not looking for someone who's going to circumvent the truth in order to suit his own ego. We are looking for the most truthful person. There are people who do tshuva very late in life, as late as the age of 40 or older. That's an amazing feat. You know why? Because when they do tshuva, you know what they're really saying? They're saying, the first 40 years of my life, I was living a lie. The first 40 years of my life, I was dead wrong. I was mistaken. You know how difficult it is to say that you were wrong when your entire life you were so convinced that you were right? That's one of the reasons why the Ba'alei Tshuva are deemed very special and holy in the eyes of Hashem. But there's something else we could learn. Think about an argument that ensues between you and somebody else. The longer you argue with the person, the harder it's going to be for you to admit that you were mistaken because at that point already, now you have to defend your position. Now you have to prove to everyone that you were right in what you were thinking. You have to protect your ego and your faulty uh, thinking. If you're going to retreat now, it's going to make you look weak. It's gonna make you feel like you lost control. And that's a lesson we could teach the lovely new couple, the Chatan and Kala, who stand under the chuppah about to begin their new life together. Quite often in a marriage there are going to be many disagreements. You must be intellectually honest. You must evaluate yourself in that moment, not the situation, yourself. And you have to search inside of you to see if there's any ego involved in this argument, if there's any jealousy involved in this argument, if there's any personal agenda involved in what, I'm, what you're saying. If you know deep down in your gut that there's something else that's lurking there that's not pure, and that really you're mistaken, you should admit your mistake. The longer you hold on to the argument, the more entrenched and invested you're going to be 
in, in what you think is right. And then it's going to be very difficult for you to pedal your way out of that argument and out of that situation. Therefore, we want to teach the Chatan and Kala. And the best example we could offer this new couple is that of Moshe Rabbeinu breaking the Luchot. Why? Moshe Rabbeinu went up to the Shamaim and he did not drink or eat for 40 days or 40 nights. You know what that means? It means he gave up his life as a human being in order to bring the Torah down to earth. He was in Shamaim with Hashem, together with the Malachim who were fighting with him in order to prevent him from bringing the Torah down to the earth. And after all those days of hard work, of finally achieving his life's purpose, he managed to bring down the most beautiful pair of Luchot. As he came down from Shamaim and made his way to the Jewish encampment, what did he see? He saw Bnei Yisrael engaging in the sinful act of the Egel, the sin of the golden calf. If any one of us was Moshe Rabbeinu, you know what we would have done? We would have taken the Luchot and set them aside for a moment. And we would have said, well, we've got to put these magnificent and holy luchot down for a second before I deal with the nation, because I work too hard and long to bring these luchot down from Shamaim. But to put it down, we would put the luchot down, and instead we would start throwing knives and forks and anything we could find. We would throw it at the people in order to make our point. But the luchot? I mean, how many of us would have thrown the luchot that we worked so hard to bring down from the Shamaim? Moshe Rabbeinu felt that the right thing to do at that moment is to break the luchot. He needed to demonstrate to the people the severity of their sin. So Moshe Rabbeinu was willing to forfeit his life's mission all the efforts he placed into fulfilling that mission, all the sacrifices he made to fulfill that mission, and he did it all for the sake of the truth. And what was the honest and right thing to do at that very moment was to break the luchot. When a chatan and kala are standing under the chuppah, we teach them, that the breaking of the glass is like the breaking of the luchot. We're encouraging them to do what is truly right and not allow their personal ego to get in the way. Marriage is not a courtroom. This is not about who's right. It's also about admitting that you're wrong. A smart person knows when he's correct. A smarter person knows when he's not correct. I'll conclude with this chidush. As we know, when it concerns a union between a man and a wife, the Torah, from the onset, already from Sefer Bereshit, offers us some guidelines. The Pasuk in Sefer Bereshit states, Al ken, therefore, ya'azov ish et avivet imo, a man shall leave his father and mother's home, v'davak be'ishto, and cleave to his wife, v'yu lebasar echad, and they shall become one flesh. Chachamim ask, only the man leaves his mother and father's house? What about the woman? She also has to leave her parents home in order to get married. Both of them have to leave their respective homes in order to get married. Why does the Pasuk emphasize a man specifically, that he's the one leaving his parents' house? The simple, a simple explanation is a psychological one. The Torah is telling us that a woman never leaves her parents' home, at least not in her mind. A woman remains connected to her parents, while a man, he's a little bit more independent and he has the ability to set forth uh, on his own uh, path. So when a woman, for example, tells her husband that she really wants to go visit her parents and she wants to go for Shabbat or Chagim, that's something that's very normal. There's a need that a woman has to stay attached to her parents. That's something a man has to recognize, something that he has to respect. That's the simple explanation. 
the deeper interpretation is that in the marriage each of you has a role the role of the man is to be a man and the role of the woman is to be a woman we are not supposed to turn a man and a woman into someone they are not meant to be so what's the role of a man in the marriage the Zohar Kadosh refers to the man as the mashpia, the one who influences the one who provides on a simple level that means that a man is required to go out and earn a living in order to provide uh, all the needs for his family if a woman wants to go out to work she can but she's not obligated to do so the breadwinner of the home is the man he was charged with the task of supporting his family now the woman receives the provisions that her husband provides and she in turn helps to build maintain and sustain the household by the way that isn't only in the material realm this doesn't only concern the gashmiut of life but it also applies for example in the area of having children the intimate union of a man and a woman that produces a child is such that a man is the giver and the woman is the recipient not only that but in the spiritual department there are roles as well it's the man who's supposed to set the spiritual pace in the home he's the one who chooses the appropriate rav for the entire family he's the one who's supposed to be maintaining the connection with the rav so that there's continued spiritual guidance in the home the man is the one who has to acquire a chavuta or go learn at a shir somewhere in some bet midash with other men that way there's Torah that's emanated in the home the man is the one who's supposed to offer spiritual direction and hopefully he's doing it the right way the woman is the recipient of all the spirituality that her husband brings to the home and into their life and then what does she do with that influence she takes all those spiritual influences that she receives in order to do what in order to build a jewish home in order to maintain a bait na'eman so each of them has designated and specific roles the man is the provider the mashpia who sees to it that the family's provisions are met whether those provisions are spiritual or material and the woman is the mekabel the recipient who's managing okay she's managing those provisions and when each of them is fulfilling their roles correctly then you've got a very positive and healthy relationship the first marriage in the history of the world was that of Adam and Chava. But what was the source of the sin that Adam and Chava engaged in at the onset of creation with the tree of knowledge? You know what caused the entire balagan? Chava decided to be the mashpia. She gave Adam the fruit of the forbidden tree she pretty much told Adam what to do and Adam became the recipient he became the mekabel he accepted the fruit and Asha was very upset about this he tells Adam Adam what have you done did you forget who you are why is your wife the mashpia why is she the giver and you the recipient why is she directing you concerning spiritual matters? Instead of you being her mashpia, you became her mekabel. You reversed the roles. The mekubalim write that when Bnei Israel went down to Egypt, Pao did something outlandish. He made the men do uh, women's labor, and the women were forced to do. Uh, the labor of, of, of men. Why in heaven's name would Pao do this? 
The Yari Kadosh, Allah Shalom, writes that Bnei Israel, one of the reasons why Bnei Israel had to go down to Egypt was to atone for the sin of Adam HaRishon. Since one of the sins of Adam was that the role of the man and the woman was reversed, the tasks in Egypt were reversed as well in order to do a tikkun for that original sin. Now when a man lives in his parents' home, you think he's giving or he's receiving? He is receiving. He doesn't pay any of the bills in his parents' house. He's a young man. He doesn't even take care of the groceries. He doesn't manage the household affairs. A young man is constantly the, the recipient of his parents' uh, good deeds, of his chesed. Before a marriage, this young man is a mekabel without any responsibilities. So what does the Torah tell us? Al ken, for this reason, when you get married, ya'azov ish et aviv et imo, a man must leave his parents' home, which means he must leave the attitude that he adopted when he lived in their home. This man has to go from being a recipient to being a giver, to being a mashpia. That's what it means for a man to leave his father and mother's home. It means he must leave behind the mindset of the taker and begin his life with his new wife as the mashpia, as the provider. So let's go back to our cup, our kos. What's the purpose of a cup? Does it receive or does it give? The cup itself is merely a receptacle that receives whatever contents is being poured into it. That's the purpose of the cup. So on the night of the wedding, you know we tell the chatan, break the glass because you're not a taker anymore. You're no longer a mekabel. You now must become the mashpia, the giver. You're leaving your father and mother's home in order to build your own home with this woman that you must now provide for, give to, and nourish with spiritual and material provisions. Break the glass. Break the mindset of the receiver and step into the role of the mashpia. Offer your new family spiritual support and sustenance. Lead them on a path of righteousness, on the path of Hashem's Torah. Well, we learned a lot today. I hope if you're already married, it can Whatever we learned can help you on, on your mission of life and your mission of life and your role. If you're not married yet, you have a lot of information that you can take with you as you walk down to your chuppah be'ezot Hashem. And we hope that it will happen very, very soon. Bekarov mamash, Yeshuot with a lot of bracha natzlacha. Having said that, before I conclude, um, Several months ago, I received an email from a, a young woman who's still single, and she was sharing with me the plight of the singles out there that every year passes and they're still not married. And she sent me a couple of her poems and songs, and I felt it would be nice to share it. And I told her, look, I don't know when I'm going to be able to do this, but as soon as I'm able to give a shi'u on shalom bayit or marriage or something, I'm going to include your poem, your songs in the lecture. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't want to say her last name, so I'm just going to say Adina, thank you so much for sending us your beautiful songs. Um, and we wish you, Bezat Hashem, that we should hear good news very, very soon. That send me an invitation to your wedding. I want to stand near your chuppah. I want to see you married already. Be'ezrat Hashem be'karov mamash. Shifan yer zivug agun. Mishoresh nishmatech. Mishashet yamei bereshit. The chatan should be na'eh. 
beautiful in every way, in every way, ruhaniyot, begashmiyot, he should be a yaresh amayim, he should be someone who has fear of Hashem, someone who's a, a Torah Jew, an Ohev Yisrael, somebody who together with you wants to build a Bait Neeman be Yisrael, and Be'ezat Hashem, we should see you here in Eretz Yisrael, building your family here in Eretz HaKodesh. These are the words that Adina wrote. In a room all alone I lie, door is closed, it's just me inside. Only then do the feelings rise deep and strong, they jolt me alive to the tears I succumb. I live a full life, work, home and friends, but when behind closed doors I just can't pretend. The loneliness, the hole, so empty and black, is alive and is kicking. Can I fight back? But a feeling much stronger than all takes hold. It's a feeling worth every pain, more precious than gold. It's God's presence here with me as I stand on my own. A reminder felt deeply that I'm never alone. His essence touches me deeply, my heart to the core, and I cry until my tears are no more. Yet the tears are not empty nor shed in vain. They are tears of feeling loved, so whole while in pain. I sit here as the future seems bleak without light, with an endless lack of stability, with no end in sight. As all around me, people move on. I'm proud of myself for still holding on. I'm doing my best with the package I was dealt, for Hashem is with me in the moments I melt. I remain connected, strong, come what may, grasping straws of hope for my salvation one day. A part of me is thankful for this stage in life, a time to build myself before I become a wife. I go on pouring my heart to the one who is with me, praying for a time where at the Shabbos candles I too can sing Vizakeni. That's a special tefillah that women sing at the Shabbos candles Friday night. Wow, Adina, May these words be a prayer to Hashem, that Bezat Hashem, very soon you should experience the ultimate happiness of being together with the one that Hashem chose for you. And we give the same bracha to all the singles out there that they should meet their Zivug Hagun this year, Bekarov Mamash. And we also bless the married couples that you should have Shalom Bait Amiti, that your your couplehood should remain strong and fortified and you should have always peace between you and you should be worthy of the Shekhinah being in your midst. You should be blessed with Nachat to see your children following in your path uh, and going in the ways of Hashem and fortifying your marriage with Emunah, with faith, with strength, um, with, a, with, with a tremendous Dvekut laboe, that's the main thing, to be dovek bashem. Yiratzon, that the messages of our parashiot enrich our lives with good deeds. May we absorb the lessons of the broken glass at a chupa and channel our neshamot towards our proper roles in life. As women, we should be zechet to always be the recipients of positive influences that will help us continue to build upon a solid foundation of faith truth, and Torah. May we one day soon see the chuppah of redemption unfold in Shamaim as we greet HaKadosh Baruch Hu and reunite with Him in a glorious celebration. Amen ken. Yehi ratzon.